All right. Good evening, guys. Let's just adjust that. A lot closer. Okay. Kind of look awful, but let's just dive right in. I'll focus on how I look. Focus on the ideas. So, just that a little bit. All right. So, we're going to be doing things a little bit differently this time. Uh, I've actually put together a text. So I'm going to be a little bit more focused. I'm also going to be editing this video after recording it. And yeah, I don't know why I'm telling you all this information. You're, you'll see it soon enough. The editing is going to look pretty terrible, but it'll get the job done. All right, so I'm essentially just going to be reading off the text I have there. So if it looks like my eyes aren't focused on the camera, it's because I didn't feel like memorizing, let's call it 1,500 words. All right, so... Let's talk about Japanese expansionism. Uh, so as part of your paper one requirements, you're going to need to know several key points. Now, it's very important to note that uh, with paper one, it's unseen text analysis, it's source analysis. So by and large, this means that you don't really need that much in-depth knowledge. The background knowledge serves more to give you some context on the events. And of course, your two case studies are going to be Japanese expansionism and German and Italian expansionism. Now, by the nature of this year's history course and just history that we've been taking for the past three years, we focused a lot more on Europe. So uh, Asia is, no pun intended, uncharted territory. So let's go ahead and dive right in. So uh, first off, we're going to have to develop a general understanding of how Japanese foreign policy was shaped by militarism and nationalism. We're also going to talk about how Japanese nationalism was formed in the 19th century and how Japanese militarism came about. We're also going to talk about how Japanese, uh, Japan's political and economic situation pushed it towards imperialism. So in terms of key events, uh, and I'm going by uh, the IB course guide here, and I'm going to be putting that up in the video, you get the picture. So uh, in terms of key events, we're going to need to know about the invasion of Manchuria. This is, I would say, integral, even if we barely covered anything to do with Japan. The invasion of Manchuria always comes up in any discussion of World War One's, you know, peacekeeping process. So the post-World War peacekeeping process, the interwar period, and the causes of World War Two. They're all linked, part and parcel. So we're going to be talking about the Manchuria crisis. We're going to be talking about the Sino-Japanese War, the second one that started in 37. And of course, we're going to finally talk about the tripartite pacts and the outbreak of hostilities with the U.S. Now, as you guys may know, uh, the official point at which America entered World War II was after the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941 a day which will live in infamy. So uh, what we're going to be talking about is how they got to that point, how Japan went from being a very isolated, uh, feudal, rural country to becoming this global superpower, well, not a superpower, but definitely a major world player that would eventually take a very heavy swing in America and represent one of the few times in American history that Americans have endured an attack on their soil. So, uh, we're going to be looking at three key points based on the IB guide. Number one, the origins of Japanese nationalism and militarism. Number two, the impact of Japanese nationalism and militarism on Japan's foreign policy in the 1930s. And the reasons for the USA's change of attitude towards Japan between 1931 and 1941. So, we're going to start off by talking about how Japan became a nationalistic country. Uh, this, this is... Uh, much more distant into the past, so a lot of this is even less relevant for you, but you still need it to get a sense of the context. Okay, so um, for most of its history, ever since roughly the 12th century, Japan was what's known as a shogunate. And a shogunate is essentially a feudal military dictatorship. Uh, shogun is essentially a Japanese term meaning like a ruling, a ruling general. So there was a military dictator at the top of the society and there were a number of lords that each had their own territory and once again under the lord on the social hierarchy there were smaller lords, samurai, and of course there'd be peasants working the land, merchants. Funnily enough peasants were not the lowest rank on the ladder, the merchant class was because in Japan they had this, I don't know if we can call it strange, that feels a little bit culturally you know, biased, but it definitely is different to us as a concept where the merchants were actually seen as the lowest rank, probably because they didn't think merchants contributed that much. Anyway, 
So uh, the shogunate maintained a very static atmosphere in Japan. They didn't like any form of change. This means no social mobility. You're born a peasant, you're born a noble, you're born a shogun, you stay there. You do not move a lot. Now, feudalism, for the most part, wasn't known for being a great way to make money and, and sort of you know, make yourself. But with the Japanese, it was even less socially mobile. So, in 1868, a U.S. naval officer by the name of Matthew C. Perry is given a job by the U.S. president, Millard Fillmore, of opening up trade relations with Japan. So, this very static Japanese government, the shogunate, didn't want anything to do with the West. There was one port, uh, the Dejima port, where they did trade with the Dutch. They had trade with other Asian countries, but aside from that, if a, if a Western ship showed up, they would usually, they would give them water and supplies, and then they'd say, all right, now you have to leave. Uh, besides that, of course, the, um, the shogunate had very little desire to interact with the West. They were also very nervous about Christianity, and this is something covered in that new Martin Scorsese movie, I want to say Silence. But yeah, so for a lot of reasons, they just shut out the West. Now, uh, Matthew Perry comes in with his uh, black ships, they're known as, and he essentially forces the Japanese to accept... Uh, to open up trade relations. He's much more aggressive, and this time he finally figures out that he has to just know how to ask, which is, you know, ask and also threaten to bomb them with his really cool ships with cannons on them. So after that, uh, Japan signs a number of what are known as the unequal treaties. And these treaties all state that Western powers have the right to do trade with Japan, and Japan just has to kind of put up with it. So Japan, as a result of this, ends up switching politically. See, the shogunate, the very feudal government, ends up being pushed out. Uh, people, opponents of the shogunate, take advantage of this, and what they do is they replace the shogunate with the emperor. Now, power is in the hands of the emperor. See, people associate the failure to deal with the Westerners with the shogunate. They fall out of favor, and uh, politically, the society transforms, and the emperor becomes the major power. So, under Emperor Meiji, an era known as the Meiji Restoration takes place. Emperor Meiji uh, pushes to reform Japan, to centralize power as much as possible. So, he introduces mass education, conscription, industrialization, centralization, and essentially, he forms a Japanese national identity. Uh, it's actually interesting... People who were against the Westerners, who started developing these very anti-Western identities, started having this chant where they would say, expel the barbarians, revere the emperor. So now the emperor, who historically had never had that much real power in Japanese society, had become the top dog. Japan industrializes rapidly, and I'm going to put up some pictures right now and show you guys that. So there's going to be a couple slides just giving you a sense of how quickly they managed to advance. And uh, in a span of around 20 or 30 years, they become a major, modern, developed industrial power. It's amazing. And they managed to do so. So unlike the Chinese, who they saw as having been you know, resisting the change and stagnating, they tried to adapt. They adopted Western ideas. But at the same time, they took these Western views and these Western ideas, and they tried to, to make them more Japanese. So they essentially tried to take the essence and uh, create a sort of Japanese national identity. So the Japanese national identity was defined by their need to become a modern nation and also to resist the influence of the Westerners. So um, they start pushing outwards, and by 1894, they are in a violent conflict with the Chinese, the first Sino-Japanese War. By 1895, they've defeated China, a country several dozen times the size of Japan, and a country which had been regarded as the foremost military power of Asia, the center of an empire, really, was now defeated by the Japanese. Now, the fact that Western powers had easily defeated China on several occasions shows us that this wasn't as big an achievement as you might think, but still. Now, the real, the real achievement comes in 1902 when they signed a naval alliance with the British. And the creme de la creme, the, the piece de la resistance, is in 1904, they take on the Russians and they win in the Russo-Japanese War. So that's the first time a Western power has allied with a non-Western power, like an alliance as equals, and the first time a non-Western power defeats a Western power. And as you can imagine, this does so much to reinforce this sense of nationalism. So 
Japanese nationalism is uh, very much based once again on, on this um, response to Western intervention and now they've formed their national identity. So. Uh, things progress. Uh, Japan enters the side of the Allies in uh, World War I. They manage to capture most of Germany's territories, and they also begin exercising more political control over China. China, in the meantime, in 1911, the Qing dynasty collapses, and the emerging Nationalist Party tries to take control, but it doesn't have enough influence and power to do so. So the Japanese continue to encroach upon the Chinese space. So, in the 1920s, uh, Japan has sort of a weaker emperor, and under this emperor, they enter what's known as the Taisho period. Uh, Japanese politicians who are trying to make the country more liberal, more democratic, who are trying to explore socialism, leftism, these things, they start becoming more influence, uh, influential. Japan also reasons that it's more, it's more rational for them to try and scale back on the militarism because it's very expensive for them to keep maintaining a heavy military and that they want to try and compete economically. Now, it uh, doesn't really work out for them. There's a couple of reasons. Number one is that Japan's plans to become more economically viable are curtailed by the Americans, who are trying to keep them uh, less powerful economically. Number two is that it, by 1929, the Great Depression hits, and their economy tanks. They're facing massive unemployment, uh, complete and utter economic breakdown. So... On top of that, there are, uh, there are lots of very conservative elements uh, in Japanese society. Uh, additionally, they pass a number of laws restricting leftist parties for security reasons. This happens a lot in these right-wing type countries where the fear of the left sort of pushes people further to the political right. So on top of this, uh, as you guys know, in the 20s, the Western powers wanted to try and make the world more peaceful. So they start signing a number of treaties that limit armaments. Now, uh, Japan signs the 1921 Washington Treaty. And the Washington Treaty basically states that everyone's going to try to limit their navies. Here's the catch. It goes at a ratio of 5 to 5 to 3. 5 to 5 for the Westerners, so they can have, you know, 5 to 3 ratio, but 5 to 5 between the Western powers. The long story short of it is... The treaty specifically says that the Japanese Navy can never get to the point where it's the same size as a Western Navy. Now, here's the thing. The moderate Japanese politicians see this as a win. They're like, listen, we need to limit how much we're spending on our Navy. But the right-wing elements, these guys who have been so excited to see Japan as a supreme power, uh, they're very angry by this. So you couple this with the wage problems and the economic breakdown, and the right starts taking more and more influence. See, their solution, instead of moving the country more politically left and liberalizing, is quite the opposite, is strengthening the power of the military and to solve the money problems, what do they do? They start taking land. So to the north, there's uh, the Soviet Union, which after its industrialization is quite the dangerous enemy, so they're not really going to take those on. But directly to the west is China, specifically the territory of Manchuria. So Manchuria is a resource-rich area just right off the coast of Japan. It's very close. It's actually several times the size of Japan by itself. So in 1905, after the Russo-Japanese War, the Japanese had actually uh, agreed that they would have a presence there, but they wouldn't own it per se. They would be able to do business, and they would also leave some soldiers. So the army group, the Kwangtung army that they left, was actually very nationalistic, and they start getting ambitious and they start trying to slowly take over Manchuria. So in uh, 29, they assassinate the warlord in charge of Manchuria. And after that, they manage to, uh, they manage to create the Mukden incident. So what the Mukden incident was, was basically they found this Japanese owned railroad. They planted some explosives on it. They blew them up. And then they, they were like, oh, Chinese terrorists are blowing up, you know, Japanese property. We need to do something about this. So predictably, the something was taking over Manchuria. So in 31, they take over Manchuria. For good measure, they rename it Manchuko. And this is part of a bigger initiative they have known as the Doka, where they basically wanted to make all of Asia this sort of Japanese sphere of influence. 
Uh, the official name for this policy was the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. And based on their propaganda, they actually sold it, well not sold it, but they, they promoted it as the idea of creating a unified pan-Asian community against the Westerners. So, what do the Westerners do as a response to this? Now, as you guys know, remember we talked about the 20s. Another feature of the 20s was the League of Nations came about. And as you guys are more or less aware, the League of Nations was a failure for several reasons. One of the major reasons that the League of Nations was a failure was several key nations weren't, uh, weren't involved. America, most notably, but also Germany and the Soviet Union. Germany would enter later under the Weimar Republic when they would start you know, getting back in the good graces. But in any case... Um, they, the League of Nations is supposed to try and resolve things peacefully. So what they do is they send uh, the Lytton Commission, headed by a man named Victor Bulwer-Lytton, to Manchuria. He investigates it, and because he's not dense, he works out that, of course, there is no justifiable reason for uh, Japan to have taken over this huge chunk of China. And he says, guys, you need to leave Manchuria. You need to give it back and you need to stop calling it Manchuko. So what do the Japanese do? They just leave the League of Nations. And the League of Nations doesn't really do much of anything. Now, why is this? Number one, the League didn't have its own army. Number two, the nations involved in the League, they weren't happy with this move, but at the same time, they thought, it's not really encroaching on any of our interests. Britain, France, they didn't really see it as being a problem for them. And on top of that, little cherry on top, China, as of 22, had its own growing communist party. And they, were, they saw China as kind of a communist country. So they figured, eh, two birds, one stone. Uh, on top of that, of course, the Great Depression had created a situation globally where most European nations were just trying to get back on their feet economically. So what happened was uh, Japan continues to increase its hold over China. Uh, in 37, there's the Marco Polo Bridge incident where Japanese and Chinese troops exchange fire uh, during uh, you know, routine circulation. This kicks off the Second Sino-Japanese War. Uh, despite the fact that both the Nationalist and Communist Party, who, by the way, I, you guys recall, were involved in their own civil war as of 26, they at some point just literally stopped fighting. The nationalists were forced by the popular Chinese opinion to put down their weapons and stop fighting the communists and temporarily declare a truce to try and fight the Japanese. The Japanese devastate them. As you guys know, the, the Japanese have been modernizing and unifying and centralizing their power and developing this ultra-powerful military for years, and China's really only militarily gotten on its feet, you know, once again, in the later 20s. So they devastate it. Uh, their military commits some really, really devastating atrocities. Uh, the Nanking massacre or rape, depending on who you ask, is, is one of the most, uh, I would say, revolting and disgusting acts of violence and war ever committed. And uh, till now, people debate how much the Japanese acknowledge it publicly. They do. In fairness, they do acknowledge that they did some really terrible things during the war. Uh, this gets the attention of the international community. Now, specifically, America becomes active. America was trying to develop trade relations with China. So this was very concerning to them, especially the violence and the extremism. And so uh, also... A couple of American ships that are trying to send supplies to China get bombed by the Japanese. So the Japanese are starting to push their luck a little bit. America responds with a mix of diplomacy and heavy handedness. They start restricting resources to the Japanese. And America has control over petroleum and auto parts, all these things. Now, the Americans don't restrict petroleum initially because they realize if they cut the oil supply off, That'll probably provoke the Japanese, which is actually silly because ultimately speaking, the Japanese were gearing up for war. But um, the Japanese start moving closer to the Nazis at this point. In 1936, they sign the anti comintern Pact because they want to make sure that they're protected against the USSR. And after the outbreak of World War II in Europe, they move closer to the Nazis, seeking an advantageous alliance. And in 1940, they sign the Tripartite Pact. So Japan realizes that it's only a matter of time before the Allied powers are attacking it. They figure the smartest play, and this is once again very ironic that they would think this was smart, is to attack America as heavily as possible. Now, I didn't mention this 
earlier. I kind of went off book. But uh, after the Tai, let me just, I got the name down. Sorry, I've forgotten it. After the Taisho, right? Is it the Taisho? Yeah, after the Taisho period of liberalism, most of the liberal uh, prime ministers and Japanese politicians uh, had either been pushed out or straight up assassinated. One Western journalist called it government by assassination. So the government at this stage was essentially full of military men or people that were loyal to the military men. So uh, it said they get the write-off in June, December 7th, 1941, once again, a day which will live in infamy. They attack the Pearl Harbor base. It's a devastating attack. They catch the Americans completely off guard. But at the same time, they don't manage to take out the American aircraft carriers. They don't manage to totally cripple the base's repair capabilities. America's up and running before long, and this kicks off the Pacific Theater. So... Uh, the rest, obviously, is part of causes and effects of wars, so that's not really concerning the paper one. What you need to know about Japanese expansionism, how it came about, we talked about that. It was a sort of a response to Japan being forced by the Western powers to modernize. Nationalism was their response to the intervention, and as they reformed as a nation, as they developed themselves they ended up uh, becoming a much more nationalistic power. In the 20s, they try internationalism. They also sign several treaties, and I'll put the names out, the Washington Treaty, the Four Power Treaty, and the Nine Power Treaty. And later, of course, they would ignore all of these treaties and just blaze right through them. And uh, finally, they expanded, of course, for the same reason that a lot of other countries expanded, to get raw materials, to get resources, uh, to deal with their population increase and their resource shortages. And of course, because they figured they were also entitled to an empire. Uh, so I would say that covers most of the background information. Just honestly looking through this and maybe checking out some other sources online should be more than enough to prepare you guys. There is a full book that I provided you guys with for paper one, but uh, I have it on good authority that it's overkill to devote an entire book uh, to just background information, more or less. In any case, uh, thank you guys for watching. And uh, obviously, look forward to doing more videos. Hopefully, this one with the editing and all will turn out okay.